Torque is going to be the topic of this lesson in my brand new general physics playlist, which will eventually cover a full year of university algebra-based physics. Now, torque is something that is super practical. If you've ever done any work in the garage or, or, or have some house projects and things of this sort, odds are you took advantage of torque in some way, shape, or form. Uh, in the same way that a, a force applied to an object can alter its motion, so a torque applied to an object can alter its rotational motion. My name is Chad, and welcome to Chad's Prep where my goal is to take the stress out of learning science. Now, if you're new to the channel, we've got comprehensive playlists for general chemistry, organic chemistry, general physics, and high school chemistry. And on chadsprep.com, you'll find premium master courses for the same that include study guides and a ton of practice. You'll also find comprehensive prep courses for the DAT, the MCAT, and the OAT. So let's dig in a little deeper and talk about what it means for a torque to alter an object's rotational motion. So if we take a quick look back at Newton's second law. So Newton's second law, we said that the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. And ultimately, we said that if there's a net force acting on an object, it will cause an acceleration. And this net force and acceleration are directly proportional. Well, in similar fashion, so if there is a net torque acting on an object, it will result in a net angular acceleration as well. So it turns out this I here is what we call the inertia or moment of inertia more specifically. So and it's going to be kind of analogous to mass as we'll see a little bit later in the lessons. But suffice to say, for an object with a larger mass, it requires a larger force to give it uh, an equivalent acceleration. Same thing here for an object with a larger moment of inertia, it will require a larger torque to give it a given angular acceleration in this case. So now let's dive into a little more of the technical definition for torque. And we've given a couple of descriptions for torque, but not the actual definition. And we said that torque can change an object's rotational motion, or a net torque can cause an angular acceleration. But again, neither of those are the actual definition. The actual definition is going to be given by this equation right here. And so first off, the Greek letter capital tau is what we use to represent torque. And it's equal to the perpendicular force times a position vector here that we call the lever arm distance, or simply the lever arm. So you'll often hear it simply said that torque equals force times lever arm. Well, you see this little perpendicular sign here. So it turns out that uh, torque is going to be at a maximum when that force is perpendicular. And so if it's not perpendicular, you're going to end up just using the perpendicular component of the force in such cases. So that's kind of what that evidence. So torque is equal to the perpendicular component of a force times the lever arm distance. Now, if you look at the units here, force is newtons, lever arm is meters, and it's a newton meter for the SI unit for torque. Now, in, in another context, we said that newton meters was equal to joules, like in the context of work and stuff. So we don't use that convention for torque at all. We're just going to say that the SI unit is the newton meter, not the joule, FYI, word of the wise. All right, now it's easiest to kind of understand how we define these terms in the context of an example. And the example we're going to use is a free swinging door on a hinge, like one of those old school galley doors that you used to enter kitchens. And you can usually push them open in either direction. You'll still see them at restaurants common times and things of this sort. So these doors, and I'm only showing one of the two doors that's usually hooked up uh, uh, at the entrance of a kitchen and stuff like that. So there's no frame on the other side here, but the door or the, the hinge is attached to the wall on one side. And if you wanted to open this door, you kind of inherently probably understand where you need to push. So most of you wouldn't try to open this door by pushing right next to the wall here, right next to the hinge. So, and that's evidence that you intuitively have an understanding of what torque is, even though you may not have understood the technical definition before this lesson. So, but the idea is that you want to push as far from the hinge as possible because it's going to be easier to open the door in that case. Well, in this case, it turns out what that really means is you want the bigger, the biggest lever arm distance possible because you'll generate a greater torque. And a greater torque means it's going to be easier to cause this door to rotate, to change its rotational motion, i.e. to give it an angular acceleration. It's just easier to open that door. So let's say we apply a perpendicular force right here. And so it's perfectly perpendicular to the door. The way we define the lever arm distance is right from the axis of rotation to the point on the door where that force has been applied. So there is our lever arm. So, and here is our force. And as long as that force is perpendicular, it's a real simple plug and chug equation, just perpendicular force times lever arm. Multiply the two together, you get your torque. But what if it's not perfectly perpendicular? What if the force applied is actually applied at some other angle? So what if I didn't understand how this door worked and I was trying to push on it just like so, pushing straight on the end? 
So, well, I have a problem. That door is not going to open in either direction in such cases. I either need to uh, have a component pointing this direction, this perpendicular direction, or this one to cause it to open one way or another. But if I push it perfectly opposite to our lever arm here, that's not going to be helpful. And somehow if I could crawl in behind the wall, or maybe, maybe I can pull the door this direction, it's also not going to open in such cases either. So it turns out if your force is either parallel or anti-parallel to your lever arm, you accomplish nothing. There's no torque generated whatsoever. And we'll see that how this kind of works. The equation you're typically presented with is F sine theta times your lever arm. So an F sine theta, it turns out, is the, the component of the force that is perpendicular to the surface, perpendicular to the lever arm. If you don't have a component there, well then this is gonna end up being zero, as would be the case in this example here. If my force is anti-parallel to my lever arm, 180 degrees opposite, well the sine of 180 is zero and the torque goes to zero. What if again, I instead of pushing on the end of the door, I pulled on the end of the door and pulled it in the same direction as the lever arm? Well, in such cases, then theta would be zero, and the sine of zero is also zero, and torque is zero. All right, so let's give a little bit different example then. So what if instead, again, of pushing perpendicular, I'll push off at an angle like so, where this makes an angle of theta, so with the lever arm in this case, with the door. All right, now I just need the perpendicular component of the force. And we can break up the force into components. We could have one component this way, one component this way. So, and the one I need is this one that's perpendicular. I don't need the one that's in, currently in this one, in this example, in the x direction. I would need the one that's in the y direction. But most importantly, don't really want to think about this in terms of x and y because I could have drawn this perfectly offset. The way you do want to think of this, though, is that the component that I need is opposite the angle theta, where theta, again, is the angle between the force and the lever arm distance. So, and because this is the opposite side, and that's the component that I need, that is the one where we'd use sine theta for the opposite side. And so it's gonna have a magnitude of F sine theta. And I can see therefore that my torque would therefore be F sine theta times the lever arm distance. And again, I've drawn the components here, but it's still being applied at that point here. This doesn't change our lever arm distance in any way, shape, or form. And so that's where the F sine theta times lever arm comes from. Now, some people look at this a little bit different and they say, well, you know, draw the force vector out and then draw a line from your hinge point that's perpendicular. And they redefine the lever arm a little bit differently. And it's truth be told, fairly confusing for students. It'll end up leading to exactly the same equation. So where you get force, but then you get the lever arm distance as being R sine theta instead. But it ends up being the same equation, leads to the same calculations but it just confuses a lot of students. So I'm not gonna go there. I'm gonna leave this as just the perpendicular component of the force times that lever arm distance. So FYI, if you got it a little bit differently, so I'm not gonna present it that way. Only go on this route. Okay, one other context we can look at this, one other convenient example, one that's common, is looking at it in terms of loosening or tightening a bolt here. So here I've got a rather decent size bolt and I've got an adjustable wrench. And if I wanted to say tighten or loose in this thing, I'd adjust the wrench in such a way that it matches up with the bolt. So and if I wanted to tighten it, I'd rotate this way. If I wanted to loosen it, I'd rotate this way. And let's say my goal was to loosen this bolt. And so I want to loosen it and I push and I push and I push or I pull and I pull and I pull it, but I, no matter what I can do, I can't loosen this bolt. So it's just solid in whatever I'm doing. Well, one reason that might be is I'm holding the wrench in an improper way. What I really should do is hold the wrench as far towards the other end of the handle as possible because now I've got a longer lever arm distance and maybe now that bolt is going to loosen as a result because I'm generating more torque with a longer lever arm. But let's say even with this wrench, and this is a pretty good size adjustable wrench, I've definitely got smaller ones than this. So, but maybe even here, I can't get this thing to budge. So what are my options? Well, one of your options would be to use a better tool for the job. And that better tool might be what we call a breaker bar. So when you put the proper socket that matches your bolt of interest on the end of this breaker bar, so, and then you hold it right next to the hinge, right? No. So you hold it way down at the opposite end and you pull. And because you've got an even larger lever arm distance now, you're generating even more torque. So, and you're more likely to be able to loosen this bolt. So we happen to carry one of these in our truck so that if my wife breaks down with a flat tire, that maybe she has a chance of getting the lug nuts off, having something that'll allow her to generate so much torque and change a tire by herself. She's pretty industrious. All right, so let's take a look at some problems here. 
And we want to look at them in the context first of the wrench. So it turns out I have exactly a two foot breaker bar uh, right there and an exactly an eight inch uh, uh, adjustable wrench. And that's going to be the, the topic for this first question. So first question says, how many times greater torque can be generated by the same force using a two foot long breaker bar compared to an eight inch long adjustable wrench? So how much more torque for the breaker bar versus the wrench here? All right. Well, in this case, again, if we look at the equation here, we can see that torque is proportional to that lever arm distance. They're directly proportional. And because they're proportional, we can set up a proportion. And so we can say that torque one over torque two is equal to lever arm one over lever arm two. And set up that proportion. And we really just want this ratio of torque one to torque two based on the breaker bar versus the eight inch adjustable wrench. Okay, now in this case, you might be like, well, Chad, these are given in inches and feet. We should convert to SI units. You're right. For most physics problems, you really should convert to SI units, although this is one where you can get away with it. The units are going to cancel. Where, whether I'm comparing the two lever arm distances in inches or feet or meters or centimeters, the units are going to cancel. So the ratio is going to be exactly the same no matter what units. And so you can choose your units in this particular example. So, and I'm going to use inches. I think that's the most convenient. But if you convert it to the metric system, by all means, you will still get the right answer. So, but a two foot breaker bar, two feet, uh, 12 inches and a foot, that's going to correspond to 24 inches. So compared to my eight inch adjustable wrench, and we can see that with a three times greater lever arm distance, we're going to get three times greater torque in comparing those two torques, uh, relatively speaking. Cool. So plug and chug, we actually haven't calculated a specific torque here. There's no units here. It's just a ratio of the torques. But in the next two questions, we'll definitely be calculating some torques. All right, the next two questions are going to involve our lovely door on a hinge example. And first one says here, what torque is generated by a 220 Newton force applied perpendicular to a door 0 0.50 meters from the hinge? And so in this case, we're going to apply a force perfectly perpendicular 220 newtons. So uh, an image is provided on the study guide, by the way, that matches this right here. So and also shows that our length of the door here to where we're applying the force is 0 0.50 meters. All right, so this one's fairly straightforward plug and chug. The force is perpendicular. So we can just plug our numbers in. So torque is equal to the perpendicular component of the force times the lever arm, which in this case was a 220 newton force that was all perpendicular times the lever arm distance of 0 0.50 meters, which is going to get you a torque of 110 newton meters. Okay, not so bad. When your force is applied perfectly perpendicular, easiest scenario. It's when it's applied at an angle that it's a little more challenging. So let's look at the next question, which is where that's exactly the case. So the next one says, so what torque is generated by a 220 newton force applied at an angle of 30 degrees to a door still 0 0.50 meters from the hinge. And so now we're going to apply this force at exactly the same location on the door, but now at an angle of 30 degrees. So once again here, all we need is just the perpendicular component of the force, not the parallel component. And that's going to equal F sine of 30 degrees. And so now our calculation using a little more robust definition for torque here. It's going to equal 220 newtons times the sine of 30 degrees and times our lever arm distance still of 0 0.50 meters. Well, conveniently enough, sine of 30 happens to be one half. Why I like choosing that angle quite a bit and do the math in my head. 220 times a half is 110 times another half. It's going to get us 55. And so the torque now is just 55 newton meters. Cool. We will be dealing with some of the more complicated problems involving like rotational equilibrium and rotational dynamics uh, in a couple lessons later in this chapter. So hopefully this has provided you with a decent introduction to the topic of torque. If you found this lesson helpful, consider giving it a like. Happy studying.